Okay, very good. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, if we're, I missed, I might have missed the intro, but if we're ready for me to talk about Reckoning Tuple, I can share my screen. You are the intro. I am Pleasure. the intro. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll present um, uh, Reckoning Tuple as it stands right now in the proposal, and we can talk about the implications for SES and um, capabilities and all that. So um, if you're not familiar with the Reckoning Tuple proposal, it's a stage one TC39 proposal to add uh, a couple of new immutable data structure primitives to the language, specifically record and tuple, which are shaped like objects and arrays, uh, respectively. Records have um, named properties and tuples have indexed properties like, like objects and arrays, respectively. Uh, they're similar in syntax to objects and arrays, except for they have a hash keyword. Um, and the important distinction here is that a record and a tuple are primitives in JavaScript. Um, they are not objects, they don't have identity. Um, they are compared structurally and they are compared deeply. Um, and most importantly, they are immutable. So records and tuples can only contain primitives or other records and tuples that can't contain objects. Sorry, um, you said uh, I was, uh, the audio uh, was unclear. Did you say they are mutable or they are immutable? Uh, deeply immutable. Deeply immutable. Im Im immutable, yes. Okay. Um, so the proposal, uh, which I won't go into every specific detail, especially ones that aren't specifically Actually, relevant this, to SES. This is like the exact right group to go into all the specific details, the ones that are like. <laughs> well, I just meant like, uh, well, I just meant details that aren't strictly like syntax things, like like whether or not we do destructuring, like stuff that isn't necessarily oh, relevant yeah. to SES. Um, th that kind of stuff I can skip. Yeah, um, I did notice something very specific to, uh, specifically interesting is that they are not only immutable, but pure because they cannot capture function pointers. Yes, yes, because yeah. functions are objects, they can't have functions inside of them. We've, we've been trying to stick with the sort of value types, intellectual tradition in TC39. And, and I hope that this can really be the data model that we could eventually generalize into user defined types. If we, mm -hmm. if we go that way. But I think starting with object and array literals is the most immediately useful for JavaScript programmers. Right. Yeah. So um, like minor implementation details like record and tuple, they're just like number and string. They have different type ofs. They are strictly different primitives. Um, let's see whatever, what other things should I consider. Um, the syntax, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's been through several iterations. If you've seen the initial proposal that was in like last October. You'll notice now that the syntax is recursive. You must specify the hash at every level. That's an important update. Oh, um, uh, that's a very, uh, oof. why? Um, it's simple. So the, 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 the case that most stuck out to us is that um, if you are writing JavaScript where you are converting objects to records and tuples, um, if you take, or if you're just writing records and doing refactoring on existing code, if you take uh, a sub, like a, like if you take a section out of a record in the case where it was recursive, where you didn't have to put the hash at every level, if you extracted it out into a separate expression, it would suddenly become an object. And it's not necessarily intuitive that that would happen because generally when you take a substructure or an object literal and pull it somewhere else, it just creates it and assigns it to a variable. But now all of a sudden you've taken these braces and moved them somewhere else and it does a very different thing. Okay. And then it will also throw. So it does this very obscure thing that we think is a really common pattern that people might run into. Mm -hmm. I can see another reason, Mark. Um, suppose that the hello array here was actually declared as a regular array instead of a, uh, a tuple. Um, then hello by implication is mutable and that's no, no. something that we explicitly, that it's, it looks like these guys explicitly want not to be possible. Well, so requiring so that- earlier draft where it would be implicitly a tuple. If you just have a hash around the outside, then uh, it would be all the things inside that are, that are, you know, curly brackets or square brackets would be records and tuples. And, uh, you know, in some earlier drafts, we actually had something wordier to set off it being a record or tuple, like const was one thing that I was <laughs> pushing for that nobody seemed to really like. Uh, now that it's a single character, that also sort of lightens the load 
for including it at every level, even though we, we could make it context sensitive, but uh, that would, it would carry these other costs. I, I think one of the benefits is that with this being explicit, um, there's no risk of confusion. If, if it's a syntax error for omitting that inner hash character, um, that makes it obvious, hey, this is immutable. Can I, can I, um, can Maybe I? Maybe that would be a runtime error in the current draft. Yeah, or, yeah, I was just going to mention that it's technically, yeah. I don't, currently not a syntax error. Um, I have a we question. just got a runtime of the type error. But yeah, Chip, go ahead. Um, can I, when I'm constructing one of these things, can I have a, 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 a literal, one of whose values is, um, an expression that evaluates to a, a record or a tuple? Uh, yes, yeah, and then it, that'll work just as expected. And if you, for some reason, return an object or something from that like expression, it would just fail with a type error. Like if you try to create a record or tuple with an object in it, it will fail at runtime. Okay, and is there a, is there a, an, an operator to, to convert a, um, a, 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 an object to a, a record or a, an array to a tuple? Um, yeah, so there are, uh, there's a whole namespace uh, uh, appendix we have full of library methods that can do this. You can pass it to the record constructor. You can also obviously use spread syntax because it'll just enumerable own properties. Okay. Um, and then for tuple, similarly, uh, we tried to model that off of the array. So you've got things like array from and array, array of, you've got tuple from and tuple of. Okay, kind of very good. So Carry the current plan to support spread. Okay. You can also use spread to get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so, so yeah, like uh, if you spread an object with functions on it though, would that, would that basically become an error or would that just mean all the properties that are not objects on that, uh, on that object literal? Um, it's currently, we, we don't explicitly mention that, but my expectation is that it would fail um, be, as just as if you had created the record literal manually with the function as a value for a property, it would fail at runtime uh, with a type error. Yeah, so, so have you considered though, uh, maybe, because I mean, the spread syntax is kind of a, a like it's implied to be a, um, a shorthand. Um, so, so a shorthand can, can have a convenient um, aspect to it. Um, I, you know, it's just an idea to consider. Um, also syn syntax wise, um, double curly braces um, means that you have a distinct delimiter on both ends. Uh, if, you, if you are going to need this thing, the limiter uh, for literal notation, I think you might want to have um, on the left and right hand side. Um, this way, this way, it's it's unambiguous. No matter um, no matter where in the code you're looking, um, just just you know, just brainstorming ideas. Like like, uh, I'm not inclined to say one way or the other is right. Um, um, yeah, no, this is a, that's a perfectly valid response. Um, that's so the the syntax, uh, especially whether or not to include like, or to in, use a different sigil for the end of the record or tuple, uh, something that got brought up. Um, one of the other alternative syntaxes we investigated was this, um, I don't know if you can see it, I might need to zoom in, oh, this yeah. curly, curly bar and, uh, and square bar syntax. Um, the polyfill and Babel transform that we've implemented experimentally supports both of these syntaxes. And it's similar. It's not quite the double curly or double um, uh, bracket, but uh, yeah. similar enough. Um, yeah. We find oh, there's a long discussion. I'd have to find the issue number, uh, but there's a very long discussion in the proposal repository and the issues about the merits, you know, bike shedding the merits of um, the two syntaxes. And there's a lot of things to consider about like editor autocomplete and like ease of typing and the people have brought up things like how far away these keys are on a standard United States keyboard, stuff like that. There's a lot of, I'm, um, I like the hash syntax, like, uh, as Dan, like for the property that Dan mentioned that it is a single sigil, but there's arguments for both. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely I up in the air. Appreciate that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So, so yeah, the hash is actually called Octothorpe in typography. So, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> now everywhere. <laughs> and there's, there's, terms of, uh, I'm using it. the hash for both uh, private and for records and tuples. And the sort of unifying mental model that I want to draw is that hash, which is like the more commonly 
I guess it's the modern word for Optothorpe. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a better one, one. trust me. Uh, yeah, that no that hash is like the integrity sigil. You know, private has integrity. Records and tuples have integrity. At a very high level, they're analogous, I think. Mm. And also syntactically, it's totally unambiguous because they're different cases. I wanted to speak to the suggestion that object spread would maybe omit function properties. Uh, as much as possible, we've been trying to design this proposal so that it's maximally analogous to uh, <clears throat> to uh, to um, objects, objects and arrays, and arrays yeah. with without without extra differences. So if we can make it so that spread just follows all the same semantics without adding extra filtering, and then you can do filtering with, you know, use object.entries or record.entries and, and, you know, call filter on that, then yeah, that would be sort of the default kind of design. Or like use a, a four dot spread, and that means, you know, we create a new operator. <laughs> so yeah, no, but but, but uh, maybe a record dot from, um, would that record dot from would still throw if there is a function. Um, maybe record dot, you know, um, from something or another <laughs> another operator that would basically just pick the the fields that um, that are not functions. So I guess yeah. another design principle that this proposal has had is minimalism, trying to add sort of as as little creativity as few things as possible. So that's why the, the API really sticks to the object and, and array APIs. We also JavaScript programmers like those. So uh, I wonder if we could add extra convenience functions as a separate proposal, especially because TC39 has a pretty good readily <coughs> adding convenience functions. Yeah, I, yeah. I like the uh, I like the hash notation for a different reason is that it, it has a bit of a nostalgic feel since uh, since I believe Brendan originally proposed a similar syntax maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Harmony of My Dreams blog posts long, long time ago. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, back to the Rina question, I think are explicit versus implicit. Um, I do like the implicit one, but I see the value of being explicit that yeah. might open the door for in the future doing some more advanced things and uh, the uh, definition of one of these structures. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine. It's a little bit more typing, but I'm fine with that. But um, seems, seems to be safer to have these implicit, uh, explicit everywhere. Uh, and then we can, we can maneuver to add new type of structures that can match fine with records and tuples in the future. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm also the the current state of this is is I like uh, the explicitness when I first saw it uh, when you first put it up uh, it kind of shocked me because I was used to the other one um, but um, you know uh, Chip's question about you can put an expression there it would be very weird to have um, an expression that looks like an array turn into a tuple but an expression that looks like a um, you know a, an expression that computes an array that might include an array to have that be rejected because it because it, it's an expression that produces an array rather than just a literal array would be right. extremely unpleasant to have that difference. Uh, right. uh, and with regard to uh, Sal's question, uh, I would definitely object to any kind of implicit filtering. Uh, errors are better for surprises than uh, implicit behavior that is not obvious to somebody reading the code. Yeah, yeah. So, so definitely a fair point. Um, so yeah, like I just, I kind of want to ask to understand and appreciate it. So yeah. Yeah, so um, are there any more questions? I, I've kind of covered the big, mm -hmm. I think we covered the big parts of reckon, the main recognition proposal. There's still more for us to cover if okay. we have time. Um, does this, but, does this proposal include patterns? No, pa do you mean so, specifically pattern matching or? I'm sorry, I, I, made this, I made this mistake before. I may, what I mean is destructuring. Mm. 
uh, we've um, been we've been talking about that, and yeah. actually, when uh, when when uh, Rick mentioned uh, de um, destructuring, it's something that we don't have a solid conclusion on, because the thing is that you can use destructuring for normal objects and arrays, and it should work, like in that example. The question is whether we allow records and tuples on the left hand side for destructuring. And the reason you might want that is so that if you have a, a rest, then that would become a record or tuple. So personally, right now, I'm leaning towards adding this, even though it would be a little bit weird because you could use it with an object or array on the right hand side and everything would work the same. It's just that it would form a, a tuple or record out of the rest part. I don't know. Except for you, if the object contained an object, in which case it would throw with the type error because you're creating a record. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Suddenly you get a type well, it, it also the semantics get very weird because if you, um, let's say you have a record that has two keys, foo and bar, foo is an object, bar is not. If you destructure the foo, but put the bar in the rest, then it will not, it then you could make the case that it would not throw because you're not putting the object in the record. It's in the rest variable. Um, but it's very, it's like you're conditionally type erroring based on which parts of the object you destructure, which feels weird. It's not a, it's not a case you have to encounter when you're just using objects. Okay. So I'm very glad that this has both been thought about, uh, well, uh, and that it's been admitted from this proposal. Did I gather that right? Or is this the destruction part? Yet. Do you think it should be omitted? Uh, uh, if is is the is the destructuring currently part of the proposal? Uh, no, I mean you can destructure a record into like a, a, an object form of a rest variable, but there's no syntax for adding that's, like, yeah. a rest that's, variable that is a record or tuple. Okay, that, that's what I meant is the syntax. Yeah. Uh, so I am happy with it being thought through, but omitted. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if you feel like it's thought through and there's um, and, and you're and you're already prepared to take a stance on a particular uh, outcome, I would I would also be supportive of including it. Um, I would do want to see it eventually. It's just a question of which one gets bundled into which proposal. Yeah, I agree. I think it's valuable. Um, I, I think I, a lot of whether or not it gets bundled as proposal depends on that weird like all the weird edge cases we find because there's some trickiness that comes up that we want to identify first. I would hold off on it personally, just because I have semi strong feelings about container types and how destructuring works right now, particularly with things like promises and uh, other things. This likely will come up again if we get to the boxed uh, objects or boxed values. Uh, um, so, I also had some questions. I know on the issue tracker, I've been asking about prototypes. Um, I don't know about your current stance. I'm still very, very uncomfortable with records having a prototype. Uh, um, my personal opinion, I mean, I think we came to agreement on the, on the issue tracker that tuples have to have a prototype. And unfortunately it has to be mutable because we keep adding methods to array prototype and we have to be able to add those to tuple to monkey patch those onto tuple prototype in a polyfill over time for record. I think that's fine. I'm only concerned with record. For records, I, I kind of feel like we should have a null prototype. I'm not convinced by the examples that Jordan gave about, uh, about that, but we have this other call with that includes him tomorrow so that we could talk through his things. Yeah, that, that topic is definitely one of the things we wanted to bring up in the record and tuple call tomorrow as well. Not that we can't talk about it today as well, just you know, context. Yeah, my, my worry is just, we don't have a strong understanding of when we would ever want to add something to object prototype anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. And further, I would say it's an important property of both records and tuples that when you access them in sort of the normal way, which is an integer index access for tuples and a uh, and a um, or at least an integer index access that's in range for tuples, 
and for records it's it's any property access then you should have some kind of reliability that you shouldn't be subject to prototype chain mutation and i think we meet that as long as we don't we meet that with tuples with <clears throat> a non-null prototype and for records we would need to have a null prototype right specifically we also meet that with tuples uh we i didn't mention it before but the grammar does not allow holes that, that was a discussion topic so as long as it's in range it should not hit the prototype one thing that this comes up with uh, is, does that mean the instance of works on tuples, but not on uh, records, if it's null? Uh, I think it's broken everywhere because they're primitives. But the, you can use the whole, the whole, When you say bro broken, I mean, there is a, there is a consistent, there is a, a, a behavior for primitives uh, that's um, very consistent in the spec as it is today that um, I'm assuming we're extending to this, which is the primitive itself has no prototype, but rather the code in which uh, a property access on the primitive is expressed, that um, uh, the first step of that property access uh, of um, uh, basically the property access on a primitive uh, turns into a property access on the corresponding primordial prototype according to the realm of the running code, of the code yep. that expresses syntactically the property access. And therefore, the, pr the value itself is completely realm-free and portable between realms because it's only the code that's accessing it that associates it with the prototype. Yes, that's exactly right. Just as with every other primitive, there's wrapper objects and dot property access just delegates to the wrapper object, which is an exotic object, which describes all these behaviors. Yeah, and the, the, then the wrapper object that's created just implicitly in order to do the dot access uh, is not actually observable uh, well, it's totally observable if you, I mean, not if you do a data access, but if you do other things like calling a sloppy mode method. Oh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just talking about property. Lookup. There's a thing that's special about the record and tuple wrapper objects, which is that they are prevent extensions. I mean, they, they, they look frozen. And that's not the case for number wrappers or other uh -huh. things like that. But I think it's important for records that if you just write a property that doesn't exist, it shouldn't like create a wrapper and then add it to the wrapper and then the whole thing gets thrown away. I think that would be very weird. So uh, overall, they look kind of like string uh, string wrappers, but they have this extra this extra thing about being prevent extensions. Okay, uh, that is interesting. Uh, certainly, will require uh, thought. Um, I mean, you know, I'm sure you guys have thought about it, but I, I, I need to think about it as well. I have not. Um, uh, it is certainly different than the precedent, but I understand the motivation for it. Um, yeah, so are there any other um, things people wanted to bring up about the main recognition proposal? Um, we, have, we can also go ahead. I have one small thing. Sure. Um, I'm not sure I really like parse immutable. Um, for a couple of reasons, and, and I'm talking about the concept of parse immutable that's mentioned in the main document. Oh, it's in the main document, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I have not been reading along. Uh, could you, somebody explain parse immutable? Uh, mm. Parse immutable is uh, an equivalent to json.parse that emits record and tuples for object literals in JSON notation instead of objects. And, this and is like our number one feature request whenever there's a draft put out that doesn't include it. Okay, People that's are wonderful. very sure that they want to do this. I like better that. Work. And you don't need it for a stringify because stringify just works on records and tuples. Uh, right. My objection is minor, um, but it is the fact that if you do a json.parse, number one, you have the reviver argument of json.parse, the second argument, which not a lot of people know about. Number two, parse immutable could really just be a couple of a couple of calls you have json parse wrapped in a record dot from or whatever the equivalent is a conversion from a uh, json parse output into a record or a tuple is what i'm getting at 
Yeah, you absolutely could. I think a lot of the reason people want this is so that they don't have have to have that object allocation in the middle or in for convenience, of course. Yeah, um, I think but you could, of course, do this computationally without it. There's very likely to be performance implications for engines that are optimized for records and tuples and parse immutable would um, be a, uh, having par parse immutable would result in a, a much, what? much more. Oh, yeah. So okay, we well, I'm not strongly well, I'm not strongly welded to my objection. Um, I mean, the, I, the, the, the thing is, is that is it for, I would expect for a huge swath of use cases, you know, I just, I, I would even guess it's like 80 or 90% of uses of JSON uh, dot parse, actually, you just want to substitute JSON dot parse immutable. Yeah. And being able to drop, yeah. being able to do a simple edit in line, being able to have an optimized, uh, uh, execution that didn't go through this intermediate translation and conversion phase, I think that's a win. So I withdraw the objection. I, I just had to raise it. I thought it was interesting. No, no. I, I, I want to uh, give a further piece of context about JSON and records and tuples. Uh, one frequent uh, performance issue that sometimes is raised to, to JS engines, maybe they should solve it magically, is the performance of json.parse of json.stringify. It's like, why would you do that? Well, it's a sort of deep clone mechanism, but only for this certain subset. Why would you do a deep clone? Well, a lot of programs uh, keep track of their current state in terms of things that can be serialized into JSON so that it can be cloned this way and so that they, then they can make manipulations as the program runs. Uh, this is all very weird. Records and tuples removes the need for such a for such a clone because it provides the db mutability and i was actually i shouldn't have been surprised but i was kind of surprised when talking to javascript application developers how well known the hazards of lack of db mutability is it got very easy buy-in from javascript developers these days because they face these problems of accidentally mutating something so uh, the, the, these these um people who would prefer immutable objects presumably they know about object.phrase yes and they run into problems with it all the time because uh they forget to freeze at some point or you know they only turn it on in uh debug mode because it has runtime cost or they didn't do a recursive freeze okay or yes they do recursive, a recursive freeze but it misses certain things Recursive freeze, especially not just a recursive freeze for object.freeze, but like all, there are a lot of, um, one of the key uh, things we mentioned um, in our like research is that all of the user land uh, immutable data structure libraries have this problem where these immutable data structures can contain mutable objects and the boundary between them is sometimes loose and hard to find. And so you end up writing a lot of code that checks, is this the mutable version or is this the mutable version? And then you have to do different operations based on each one. And so have that you, mix gets, it is a huge pain. We're when talking about all, state. When, you, when you say all the libraries, have you looked at SES and hard, with hardware? We have not looked, we have not done the same level of digging. Um, the, the libraries I'm referring to specifically are like immutable JS and Immer and the related like. Um, and, and I think React, React also, React state is one of those places where they give you uh, a set state method and then they do their mojo and you know okay. uh, so so just about parsing mutable uh, one last um, just um, clarification I guess what would a reviver argument mean in that context just just for for people to kind of like if they come up with ideas that would be nice because um, I mean it's clear when you want to recon reconstruct serialized state um but what would you do with it um in that context i'm just wondering that's a good question um i'm not exactly sure i mean i, I don't know what would be different i mean you can you would revive them to like i think it might be the same I, I have a funny feeling that you might want to um exclude reviver in this case um for now, at least early on. Um, definitely, you want to file a ticket on it. But um, I think early on, you may just not want to support a reviver for this, just because it adds more um, possibility of things going wrong. 
I mean, I think that if you asked everyone in this room whether they actually wanted Reviver to continue existing anywhere, the answer would generally be no. Oh, I don't know. I'm I'm a little bit excited about that proposal. I to use add the it. extra argument to the Reviver so that it can like reconstruct the string so that it can interpret big ints as big ints or things like that. But maybe <laughs> I know we use Reviver, so <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, no. Re Reviver <laughs> has its uh, has its uses. It's you know edge cases, but they're still not very edge. <laughs> I lost. I lost my bet. <laughs> I wanted to draw question, attention to a couple I, I would, subtle. I would side with the put a stake through its heart, but that's because I've been writing JSON parsers for too long. Ah, well. So question question about the parse. Um, I I noticed that stringified is not there, and I'm I'm curious about why. Why you, you can just use normal JSON stringify to work. But it will produce a JSON, not a string that Stringify can be used. Will produce a string, and strings are already they're already primitives. So we're well, no, he. No, means, no, I mean, I'm talking it, in the context produces, of. I I feel in the context of trying to move these immutable structures from one realm to another and such. Uh, if you're there's well, there's two contexts in which you're trying to um, when you talk about just moving them between realms. Uh, there's no reason to go there's no reason for using the reference right but if, if it is a from i should say probably around different process or something okay if you're moving them across processes it's still useful to divide two cases uh, one is uh, where the underlying implementation is able to uh, share pointers uh, in which case these things are, are not just independent of realm they're actually independent of agent uh, depending on how you implement them of course but they should be independent of agent so you should be able to share them between processes that are in the same address space by direct pointer sharing. Uh, however, if you're doing it between address spaces or between machines, then obviously you need to serialize. Um, Do we have any, any feedback from implementers on whether or not they will share these between processes? So a case that this comes up in for implementations for direct pointer sharing is on the web with workers. and um, so the interface that you would use to transmit a record or tuple to a worker would be post message. Yeah. So there's a, there's a segment of this, which is integrating post message, you know, integrating HTML serialization and deserialization to records and tuples. That's pretty trivial. Uh, and the spec text just looks like copying it basically. Um, okay. About whether they would actually use direct blender sharing. My understanding is sometimes they might, sometimes they wouldn't. Probably the initial implementations would be copying uh, some some JavaScript engines uh, have multi-threaded heaps, and some really don't have multi-threaded heaps. Right. Yeah. So that, that, I think I we're gonna. There's a lot of stuff with records and tuples where you might where you would really want uh, good performance. So you would want performance when sharing between workers. You would want performance also when doing a modification with a spread either adding elements or replacing elements. You might expect that it have a kind of rope-like treatment, like strings sometimes do. And I thought about that. Maybe this proposal is uh, to guarantee that implementations can perform such optimizations to make them unobservable, but to be clear in communication with JavaScript developers that they can't expect that they'll always be there. And another right. optimization like this is, is comparison with, with triple equals or any of the comparison operators. They're all the same for records and tuples. Uh, that it would be valid for implementations to do hash consing and they're definitely not required to and it's unobservable whether or not they do. So, so okay, fair, fair enough, but, and the, the second part of the, go ahead. Well, we, would, we might expect some to, some to do structure sharing or some to do hash consing, but we would also expect others to not. So Daniel, the, the second part of the question is, so we, we went from realm to realm to process to process and now we go over the network. I and mean, especially specifically on, on server-side rendering, which is becoming even more popular. And even the engines are implementing something like the, the potential uh, shadow DOM, sh shadow root, um, declarative shadow root and such. Is it going to be possible if I'm rendering the page on the server-side, being able to send 
some of these structures down to the client in a serialized way without having to do some some weird magic. Uh, I don't know enough about declarative shadow DOM to answer that. No, I mean, the, the declarative shadow DOM is just to highlight that there is a also a, a, a it's the, the engines are nowadays um, there is a sense of what the server side rendering is a thing that is important for some people just just to highlight that but uh, not necessarily related to what I'm asking the, the question is whether or not I will be able to run some code on the server side that use some JavaScript that does some serialization and send those structures to the client side to be used. I mean, you know, in the in the current proposal, you could stringify and parse immutable or parse and use record from. Uh, there isn't any current work in terms of like making that process more efficient, if that's what you're leaning towards. Um, you would still so I you mean, stringify with JSON, you get a JSON down to the client and then in the client, what do you do to make it a let, 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 So let me uh, anybody who's doing this today and wants a high fidelity um, uh, copying of what one would normally think of as JSON data, they're trying to do high fidelity. They already have a problem with, uh, with NAN and infinities uh, and undefined. Uh, let's just take NAN and infinities. And, uh, you, could, you could say that undefined should not be included. But having floating point not be able to transfer NANs infinity is really irritating. Um, so uh, uh, at Agoric, we want both high fidelity and we want it to include a lot more pass by copy than uh, uh, JSON directly represents. Uh, so uh, we have, and I, I believe many other projects have, uh, just defined our own escaping convention essentially of encoding in JSON um, that uh, over here should go something that uh, is decoded, um, uh, you know, uh, decoded to a NAN or decoded to an infinity or decoded to something. So there's some kind of, uh, you know, special uh, convention that normal objects are supposed to avoid that the serialization can make sure does not appear on the input. Uh, then it produces that escape record for recognition on the corresponding unserialization side. Um, and that method of encoding that you have to do today for high fidelity, uh, JSON LD, linked data would be another example of this. Um, uh, that extends, I think, very, very pleasantly to this because you would just have uh, one of those um, escape cases say, uh, what's contained in here is immutable. And because that's transitive, you only need to do it at the outside. Uh, and then everything inside would just get, um, uh, 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 depending on where you're doing the conversion, uh, it might need to be uh, uh, post-processed by a, um, a reviver, um, but it would still end up producing uh, in place, the correct structure. So, um, so I, I had one thing come to mind when when this discussion was happening. Is basically, um, how do I go from an object that has um, deep in it some records and uh, tuples, and then um, end up with a string, and take that um, elsewhere and basically generate that same structure? I know I know that you might use a particular contextual serialize, deserialize, or unserialize. But um, it just feels to me that until we, we talked about this, JSON was very clear. You, you get an object. Now we're saying we're just, depending on the parse function that you use, you will get that. So, so it seems to me that we're kind of wiring it to how you want to decide everything in that uh, string. There, there's two very different uses of JSON and this would preserve the dichotomy. Uh, many uses of JSON are just limited to direct uh, usage of what you can represent in JSON. And, th and those uses, uh, you only have uh, objects and, um, and arrays and uh, primitive data that does not include undefined, does not include NAN, 
uh, does not include infinities, oh. and does not include bigot. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's certainly a usage of JSON, and it already being limited to not being able to represent floating point infinities makes it clear how limited it is, but it probably is by far the vast majority of use of JSON. So we're not changing that. Uh, and then any use of JSON that's trying to be higher fidelity has to do an encoding already. And any encoding has to be coordinated with the corresponding decoder. If whatever, you're, whatever encoding you're using, you have to make sure to use the same, the same representation, both at the encoding and decoding sides. You already have that coordination. Yeah, I, re I really think there's room for a separate orthogonal proposal here. I keep hearing feature requests for this. It was really the number one feature request for BigInt. I want to put BigInt on JSON. And I would explain to people, you do this encoding thing. Everybody says, oh, that's so annoying. Can I like convert it to, can I just do two string? And like, you, you could, but then you're going to have to coordinate on the other side and, you know, keep track of your schema to convert it back to big int. And, you know, uh, I think um, even I, as much as I totally agree with Mark about what the solution is, somehow it ends up being hard for people to conceptualize some of the time. I, I think what, what people get hung, hung in is, is this idea that when you have a standard way of doing things, um, it is a universal way to exchange. But when, once, once you start putting um, um, like opinions, um, unfortunately end up with whoever can muscle their opinion if, the, if there will become sort of a convention. Um, and, and, and these things tend to create more, more bugs um, um, you know, when, 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 when you have more than one opinion, kind of like acting as if they made an argument why they're better, but they're really just making okay. an argument on why they're yeah. bigger. Right. I don't, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any wiggle room on this one. Uh, yeah. Jason itself is simply not going to change period. It will never be able to have a direct representation of nans and infinities. Uh, and that means that there must be an encoding to be high fidelity. Uh, and I think the right answer to uh, what's being raised here is to have a winner among the encodings in the sense of some rising to become the de facto and eventually de jure standard uh, supported by libraries and maybe eventually even supported by some further function in the language. So, so this, is, this is a complete digression, but um, opportune point to mention it, which is I am, I have a, a sort of back burner project, which is, which is working out um, an API for, for doing exactly this to, to handle the encoding of different things. Something that's a little bit more ergonomic than the, the reviver uh, mechanism that's designed to deal with all of these different encoding questions. And because it's my job, preserve the, 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 the fact that the JSON spec is set in stone and also to deal with the need to uh, be able to process very large, in fact, infinitely large uh, JSON objects in a streaming fashion. Um, it's not ready for prime time yet, so I haven't surfaced anything to share with people, but this is a, an active uh, project of mine. Yeah. When you decide to surface it in whatever form it takes, we'd be very interested in collaborating to I, I think there's lots of folks who would be interested in such a thing. And I'm just, it's, 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 it's only about a quarter baked at this point. Yeah, I'm excited about it too. I, I, I mean, I, I, wanna, again, I wonder well, if we could close the JSON discussion because yeah. Uh, yeah. it seems like we're agreeing on the design of parse, JSON parse immutable modulo someone thinking about the reviver thing, which honestly, I don't have a great idea. Yeah, I, I think it's a distraction in, in the current discussion. So yeah, no, I, 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 I raise it, I raise it just because uh, the, I, I work initially on uh, serialized JavaScript, which is a very popular library. We did it at Yahoo many years ago. It has like more than 10 million uh, uh, downloads per week. And and, and it, it does the things that Mark was explaining. It does all that. Just wanted to make sure that I get the right semantics around what, what we'll be able to do there in that library with something like this. Okay. 
Um, so uh, we're Sorry, done with I want to understand is do you think there's do you think your kind of library could use records and tuples or do you think there's anything that would make sense to I think it, I think it would be possible yeah I think it would be possible that a library like that will, will be able to serialize when very popular on server-side rendering so you do your operations and then you serialize something to the client that gets evaluated at JavaScript not parsed it just gets evaluated on the client side let me paste it on the chat here this is, this is the library I was talking about okay I'll give it a look so before before we go on to the follow-on proposals or the, the the related proposals, I wanted to draw attention to two core uh, semantic aspects of records and doubles. One is records only have string keys; they do not have symbol keys, and this was the result yes. of a very long discussion. So it, the reason is uh, well, one important thing about records is that they're order independent. So if you have a record with a a1 b2 that's the same record as with b1 d b2 a1 and uh you know we have to make a well-defined for in order or well-defined you know object dot keys reflect dot keys order own keys uh so <coughs> so they have to be sorted but we couldn't find a good sort order for symbols that wouldn't uh expose something or other about the symbols so our current our current thought is to just ban symbols as record keys i support uh, that decision thanks I for do your too. help in the discussion mark All right okay. seem seems uncontroversial okay the other the other core design decision was that uh Uh, sorry, now I can't. I can't remember. Uh, I guess we can go into the other ones. Yeah, we can. We can always come back to it. Um, do, you, do you support uh, computed the the uh, yes. computed property names? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and if you, uh, it got mentioned by someone recently. Uh, we would probably just use instead of two property key, we'd use two string, which throws on symbol. So if you use a computed property key that is a symbol, it would just throw a type error. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, the, we can, uh, Dan, feel free to interrupt me whenever when you remember what you were thinking of. Um, but we can move on to some of our related complementary proposals. Um, I guess we should probably cover the simpler one first, which is deep path properties. Uh, do you agree with that, Dan, or should we just move on to boxing objects? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that one. Uh, see if I can remember the URL. Uh, yeah. Um, so deep path prop. So um, we created a couple of um, complementary proposals to kind of solve some of the ergonomic, um, I wouldn't say concerns, because we think that the MVP is comp or the record table base proposal is complete and valuable without it. Uh, but we're actually debating um, moving deep path properties into the proposal itself. Um, so deep path. So um, one of the ergonomic um, I guess you could say problems with record and tuple is that because they're immutable, um, you can't easily change the values in them or can't easily create a new record with um, copy values if the record is deeply nested because spread only works at one level. Um, so we are proposing an additional um, spread syntax that if I can find it on this page. I think you were. Um, it was right at the top. Oh, did was it right at the top? Uh, I skipped it. Oh, yeah, it totally was. This is the example I was thinking of, uh, where you could describe um, nested properties that will be updated in the resulting record or tuple um, via traditional spread syntax. Uh, this is pretty much the whole example. It's pretty succinct. Um, we're considering moving this into the main proposal repository because it's relevant, other than the syntax cost. It's relatively low impact semantic wise, uh, just for record. Object, it gets a lot more complicated. We haven't um, figured out what, we, we're currently specifying this is not possible for, for objects themselves. Uh, I, I would find that unfortunate. Uh, I think that uh, it has just as much value for objects. And I think the non-uniformity of having this work in records and tuples and not objects and arrays would really be not good. Um, 
uh, I mean, to have something work in one and not the other when there's an obvious semantic reason why they're just different, uh, that I could understand and explain. But in this case, uh, so there's no reason. Uh, maybe I could explain the reason. Uh, okay. And you can say if it's convincing. Okay. So uh, with records and tuples, they don't really have anything except for what you would be accessing through, you know, replicating through spread. Uh, you know, if you, for, for both a record and a tuple, the identity spread returns the same value. Uh, this isn't the case for objects. Objects have all kinds of other stuff going on. They have prototypes, they have uh, internal slots. They have identity. Uh, you do the identity object spread or the identity array spread, you don't just get something that has a different identity, you get something that may be different in all sorts of other ways. And um, so I felt like it would be weird to have this syntax that just implicitly does all these identity but overriding one part spreads for objects and arrays. So um, I think that I think that that the implication is that it does do the conversion as deeply as the syntax that you're using. Um, uh, the you know the um, uh, the destructuring syntax that only has a uh, a a uh, rest and nothing else is not doing identity thing. An expression is doing only spread and nothing else is not doing identity. In both cases, on the object side, it's doing a copy with all the conversion that you're talking about. So if I do deep paths combined with rest or spread, uh, I would um, I understand why it's a little subtle that it would do that copying as deep as the path notation that I'm using, but I think that is the correct generalization. And in this case, I don't think it's too surprising. I think I still think it's pretty surprising. When you see a quick path like this, you don't think, and you, and you see a spread, the spread should be the part that's copying the object, but the spread's only doing a shallow copy of the object. It doesn't, when you see the path, the path is what will call for this object to be kind of mutilated and treated in only its shallow form. That to me feels very non-local. So I have uh, two, two comments about these. The first one is that um, I, I, I feel that we should focus on the MVP rather than adding things that could be added later on, just, just for the sake of moving forward and not having controversy around it. And the other part of it seems very straightforward. This one's a little bit complicated. The second comment is that isn't this a foot gone in, in a sense, like it's really easy to mess up and maybe mistype one of the path and what happened there, right? If you do the incorrect path to the object, uh, to, I mean, to the to the tuple that you're looking for, or something like that. What happened there? I don't think it's quite the same as doing it uh, explicitly one by one uh, in the structuring pattern. But uh, it might it might be that I'm wrong here. But it feels to me that it's probably moving this to phase two is is, a, is the right thing to do now. And we know we know how how it goes with complex. Uh, uh, complex uh, features like this. What happens when you have compute values in, in the path of the I, thing that you want to, to get I to? I could see the argument from the perspective of there are a lot of tricky edge cases and we um, there that are controversial. Uh, but I would argue that from an ergonomics like uh, syntax complexity, like this is too much to push on the user it's this or like the talking about like mistyping paths. Um, our exam or our our demonstrations are that the there's much less of a chance of that happening because there's way less code on the screen. Like it's a way more ergonomic uh, and terse way of describing the same computation. Like this this um, deep path spread here is functionally the equivalent of this, but you have to specify the state one identifier many more times. Um, so if you're arguing for... Is it, is it true the same or what happened if you don't have a state one? 
Um, what, well, what this do you would mean by this mistyped path problem. It's very hard for me to understand because if you imperatively mutate an object, you would use the same path syntax, basically. So what what are you talking about mistyping? Yeah, I mean these so, are the same member expressions. Uh, again, I, again I might be missing something here. Like if I, if I, if the if you're destructoring uh, state one there, like you destruct that. And inside, I mean, in this case, it's only, only one level, but let's assume there is more, more than one level there. Uh, but if you're destructing that and you are specifying certain bits that you want to flip, uh, but the path that you're using does not exist on the original. Then tuple, you get a type error. You get a type error, right? Yeah. There's, and there's also no destructuring in this proposal. Maybe that's something that could be changed. But. Right. So when, when you come, that's what I was saying. When you combine the structuring with this, it, I, I feel that then you, you also mix in compute values for the path that you want, something like that. Like it becomes a little bit weird for me. So and I, I think uh, I, 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 have, I have a proposal. Structuring would make this weird because with destructuring, also, if you do an extra path level where the thing doesn't exist, then you would get the same kind of type error. I, I have a proposal. Uh, yeah, it, let's works? take just, I'm sorry. Sorry, keep going. Okay. Uh, let's take the state two that's uh, on the board. Uh, whoever's projecting, can you just copy that definition of state two into an editor? Um, yeah, one second. Yeah, and just as perfect so we can get the, uh, the um, syntax highlighting back if we want it. Okay. Now the um, the count the line three that's a three level deep um, path, correct? Yes. Okay. So on line two, uh, after the triple dot and before the state one, I want you to type open curly dot dot dot. Open curly dot dot dot. And then on the other side, um, do the closing curls. Okay. The I would so my suggestion is that if you want whatever your deepest path is, you have to do uh, that dot 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 nesting um, uh, on the at the dot 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 site, and. Notice that it has, it expresses exactly the semantics that if implicit would be surprising. It converts state one to an object. It can, it, and then it converts it, you know, to a flat object. It converts it to a flat object again. And then finally it, it, it um, uh, spreads the flat object. So at that point, the, um, the, it's, clear that uh, three levels deep, you're operating not on uh, some original object in the spread of state one. Uh, no, it doesn't. Okay, but I'm the, sorry. That Everything expression I doesn't work, but I really like the, uh, the spirit of this. I think we would just have to think about yeah. what kind of expression would imply this kind of deep copy. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a I'm a fan of making this more clear via maybe disambiguating it from just a shallow object spread. Um, but this syntax, I, I find it hard to read this specific syntax. Yeah, yeah. My, my semantics, as I tried to talk it through, I completely had the wrong semantics in mind. This does not work. Yeah, just uh, again, uh, I feel that all these could be uh, phase two kind of uh, proposal, like. Once we have the MVP, we, we go back and we improve over this one. It should be easy. So um, I want to explain the reason that I've been encouraging investigation into uh, both these deep paths and then this box proposal that we'll probably talk about next. The reason is because when we presented records and tuples to people, these were the concerns that people raised. How do you do these deep updates? That's, that's a major regression that you have from mutable data structures. And then how do you point to objects? The, the goal of these proposals is to constructively respond to those concerns. So we can't decide to do them later, but uh, I do think that it's worthwhile for us to think, them, to think them through to make sure that we have a good sort of 
general direction forward. Yeah, and uh, in terms, like we're not, this isn't merged into the main proposal yet. It's a topic that we're actually gonna discuss during the June update. Um, we, we're gonna bring it up, bring it to the committee for more investigation. Because during the last update, there were several committee members that mentioned during that, uh, during that meeting uh, that they would like to see this merged into the main proposal when we showed it at stage zero. Um, but I very much appreciate the feedback that maybe it should, like, I think we just need to come to a conclusion as a, oh, I, I, a love, I love that this explores like second and third order effects of a proposal for a language feature. I, I think that it's, uh, every, every language feature, uh, especially syntactic ones like this have implications for what people are going to think of after this becomes reality. Well, why didn't we also do this? At least that would be consistent that, and then, you know, and then, okay, now we're in that world. And then these ideas would be consistent. Um, right. So I think that it makes a great deal of sense to figure out what those are ahead of introducing something as um, novel as yeah. this new notation. Right. I mean, a lot of this is that we've received an, like an outstanding amount of community feedback. Um, about this and there's been a lot of people that have played with it in the playground um, that want to provide feedback on the ergonomics before it lands as an orthogonal feature in the language. So yeah, exactly echoing that thought. Yeah, and, and having records and tuples is part of a, as I recall, a larger vision that has uh, uh, for value types in general um, and having that fully explored before committing seems like a good idea too. Um, well, yeah. I can't claim to have fully explored value types. There's, there's this fundamental thing that maybe we can talk about in the context of the box, uh, mm -hmm. box concept. Yeah. I have a question on the, on the gist that we have in front of us. I, and again, I apologize. I haven't read, um, the, the deep path pr uh, proposal. Uh, what is, what is the implication of having on say, uh, introducing a line between two and three, where you state that counters is uh, is a tuple uh, with values zero and one. You oh, mean like I think these would these apply sort of one after the other. So the later updates override the earlier updates. So they're they're implicitly merged. They're they're done in in sequence. So yeah, um, I mean like this. I am, is uh, so the, my, my question is basically is like each property uh, each 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 um, each each clause that you introduce into this in this comma li delimited list of the record declaration is that uh, implying a merge with the state implied by everything that preceded it so yeah. if you look or, at or replacing it or possibly replacing a piece of it so if you look at how object literals are specified it literally is just an object dot defined property over and over again. So if you have repeated keys in an object literal, it's just going to overwrite the previous key that was in the same object literal. I see. And so in this case, the implication is that line four is first going to access counter zero of whatever preceded it and then assign to a property of that. Um, so if if on line, if now between with the state as it is if you if between line three and four you said counters colon and then another array or actually a more more illustrative example is between lines five and six if you then said counters is uh, uh, let's just say the string gotcha the result would be just having the field counters with the string gotcha and everything before all of the counters manipulations before would be discarded. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that seems sensible. Good. Good. I like it. Okay. Um, if there's no other topics or discussion on the uh, deep path properties, I, um, I I do want to go back to record and tuple for a moment. Um, sure. And I I want to keep it short, no more than five minutes. Um, I did notice something. I just realized something. The names record and tuple are likely to collide with user space. Um. I mean, what are the odds that somebody out there doesn't have a record function in their JavaScript? It, it, it collides very directly with certain things. Um, so immutable, I can't remember off the top of my head which, which library it is, immutable JS or Emmer. One of them has a record type that is a more like a struct. It defines a set of like right. properties. What I was going um, to suggest is simple. 
that um, we renamed these to immutable record and immutable tuple. Oh, I imagine that that's- You know, we, we've chosen the name records and tuples partly based on Brendan's vision, but also, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about other possible names. And really these, these ones seem really nice and, and terse. Yeah. Like I think having a good short brand for this is really important to, to helping developers. Yeah, and I will, I'm, I, I, I'm not I, sure. I'm, I don't think that using the same name as some library uses is necessarily a web compatibility problem. It's only yeah. going to be a problem if somebody uses the name and like attaches certain conditionals around it. Like if there's some widely used site that says, okay, if type of window dot record is not undefined, then, you know, blow up or, right. you know, assume that it's filled in with something that I expect, which you haven't might but that's like an empirical question. I haven't done a deep web compatibility dive yet, but for my initial um, investigation, that's not the case. Um, the only user land library that's like popular enough in the immutable space, especially to do this, doesn't assign, like doesn't create these globals. Um, they're namespace under the, like under the module. Um, the other conflicts, something to consider, I'll bring it up, is that um, there is a TypeScript built-in type called record. Uh, it's not a conflict per se because um, the, there's no syntax ambiguity there. You know, one is in type space, one is in value space. Um, we're, we, we've talked a little bit with TypeScript to figure out what to do there. Um, they're not, they don't seem to be like concerned on like blocking the proposal on that. Uh, but it might just require some education on the TypeScript side. We can help with that to like figure out how to describe to people that these are different, maybe a flag somewhere. Um, the other conflict is um, at the spec level and at the web IDL spec level uh, because there is a specification level record, but this is mostly an editorial problem. Um, and a few different people have expressed the opinion that it doesn't really okay. like the, the, re the specification level record isn't important compared to the runtime level. Okay. I, I'm just playing devil's advocate, advocate here, guys. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, no, this is extremely valuable. It's, it's important. It's, you know, we, I, if it ends up being called record and we have to rename all those instances of the specification level record in the language, I will volunteer to do a lot of that work because I would feel very sorry if the changes we added made someone do all that. Good, I like everything so far. Great. So if we're back to records and temples, there's a core API design question that I wanted to pose to you, which is uh, for things like NAN and negative zero, Mm. Uh, there's the question of what do you do with, um, you know, is it the same, not, not is it the same record or tuple because it, it's observably different object that is will be different, but for double equals, um, and triple equals should things be triple equals if they they should a, a tuple containing NAN. the, the current place that we landed on is this was not, uh, <laughs> this is not an awesome thing to make these special values. And uh, there's probably a bunch of code that expects that NAN and, you know, plus and minus zero are the only values in JavaScript that, that actually operate so weirdly when it comes to triple equals. It, it would be great to not expand that set. So the idea is that, uh, as you can see here, a tuple containing NAN triple equal is the same as the, the tuple containing NAN, but it also triple equals it and um, negative zero and positive zero are not, neither are they the same value, nor do they double equals or triple equals. So um, this is a simplification. I think that the answer for this question is, I'm so glad you brought it up. We have seven answers. Yes, that seems to be the answer so far. Well, I mean, we, we, have, we have other answers that we considered and this is the, this is the place we got to. Uh, at this point, I would be, I'm, I feel pretty attached to, to this particular answer and I'd be, but I'd be interested to hear if you feel some other way. Oh, my feelings are uh, confused, but the, uh, I think the way, the way to look at this is to answer questions about what you need from equality and triple equality. Um, because those, the, what you need seems to be uh, what motivates us to have different answers to that question in various contexts. Um, but because these are a value type, I assume, mm, I won't assume, uh, 
So one question is, do you intend for these things, th these to be used as keys in a map or possibly a weak map? Uh, yes, actually, people have yeah. expressed uh, immense desire for this. In a map, yeah. yes, in a weak map, no. Well, yeah, sure. not in a weak map because they're primitives, but yeah. Good. In yeah. And in a set, of course. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, so it would be, that's right. Okay, cool. Um, good answers both. Um, and because because you need them to be suitable as keys in a map, it's necessary for um, identical keys to be usable um, uh, to retrieve the same exact value again. There should be there should be no there should be no case where um, you can use a, a a value to add something to a map or set and then not be able to retrieve it again with the exact same. Uh, key. Right. Without like iterating the map or something. Yeah, exactly. So uh, your, your last... It's also a long time your, problem your... of if you have a pair that you want to be your map key, <laughs> otherwise you, you have to use like nested maps and it's very awkward. This just elegantly solves it in a way that... That's or intuitive. serialize it to a string and put a dash in between them or something. Very common pattern that this would alleviate. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, that just sort of falls out uh, from this that's very pleasant is... Um, whenever I, almost every time I write triple equals, uh, I'd say, you know, like 98% at least, uh, I would have rather said object dot is, except that it's more awkward to type. Um, yeah. uh, the, uh, over here, you can, uh, where you would have said object dot is, you can instead say, uh, sharp open bracket, whatever, um, uh, you know, uh, triple equals sharp open bracket, whatever. So by just so square brackets. So by just doing singleton uh, tuples on both sides, you have a syntactically pleasant way of uh, getting the object that is semantics. I, I don't know if I would call that syntactically pleasant, that idiot. Yeah, I, that feels very double bang in front of an expression thing to me, but all but it seems you, possible, of course. Uh, yeah. But it, um, so yeah, whether you like it or not, this that would be a consequence of this proposal, and um, I think some people would like it. I think maybe I would like it. Um, uh, in any case, uh, good. Um, uh, so the the answer is for all four of these JavaScript equality operations, uh, when it recurs, it's doing only object dot is deeply. Is that that the the outcome? Exactly. Okay. Good. Great. And then object beha mm -hmm. dot is behaves in this case for record of tuples exactly the same as triple equal, because um, it will just recur naturally in the same way. The interesting part of what, of what Mark just brought up is actually to me that it exposes at a syntactic level uh, the the same the object that is um, machinery in a way that doesn't exist right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's that significant because you can already build that using things that are syntactically available. It's just kind of ugly and special case. -y. Yeah, I mean, you can polyfill object is in user land, so you can I mean, technically you can express it. You, you would have a lot of trouble polyfilling in user land to get you know totally right integrity wise, but triple equals is one that you that doesn't fall into that difficulty. Okay, boxing. Boxing, let's move on. Okay, like great. Array dot is array would be pretty difficult to, anyway, we can go on to another. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll, um, okay, so boxing. This is a large problem space, um, but I'll just go through top to bottom. Um, so record and tuple, um, one of the key goals is to have deep immutability guarantees. So you, you can't, if you try to put an object or a function or whatever inside of a record or tuple, it'll throw a type error. Um, and one of the key reasons we did that is for one, for just ambiguity and ergonomics. Um, it was a commonly requested or commonly mentioned um, sharp edge when using user land immutable libraries. And so it provides uh, alongside all the primitives and the pureness and all that stuff, it provides some nice guarantees that uh, programmers will uh, or tell me that they will enjoy. Um, you just used the phrase sharp edge. Oh, is, wait, sharp. Oh, like, oh, okay, I see. Yes, sharp. Um, gosh. Uh, yeah, as, as Salo was mentioning that it's technically octothorpe, but I guess that's really only true among people who can't agree between hash, sharp, and pound. <laughs> right. You should have some, like, 
corned beef breakfast kind of code sample here. I'm sorry for the digression. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> no, yeah, totally. Um, what was I saying? Oh, okay. So um, even with that key goal of being immutable, people would like to be able to express or like point to things that are mutable or like have, want to have the opt-in ability to point to some external structure that isn't immutable. Um, and there are a few cases in which you'd want to do that. Um, we describe some um, user land solutions to not, um, to provide that kind of solution without um, introducing a new primitive, like we will present at the end of the proposal. Um, you know, for example, if you want to attach a method to an object, you can just do that with closure, wrap the object and do whatever you want. But in a record, you could, for example, store that state you needed in the object on the record itself and then have some external function you call, you know, with like an action. Uh, you can do something like that. It's a very trivial example. Uh, you can do the identity spread to copy the properties of an object into a new record that you then use inside that record so that you just make a copy of the object where needed instead of storing the object directly and getting a type error. Um, there are some more advanced use cases where you might want to keep track of a set of references for a given structure that you might want to swap in and out. Um, the common refrain on uh, in the community and sometimes in the committee is something like a virtual DOM where you have some virtual structure that represents a do document that is static, that is comprised, uh, comprised of records and tuples. And then you have slots or holes or something similar that you slot these mutable references into. Um, and you might, you, you can accomplish with this mostly with user land by creating some wrapper that generates, you know, uses primitives to like, indicate holes in the structure via like numbers or you can use symbols and their identity to do that to like have these references. You can abstract that out into a class that, you know, does all this for you um, and takes care of a lot of this machinery. And then, you know, it's just like a, a, a bit of code to dereference these, you know, some external map. That's all trivial. You can, you know, yeah, uh, I wanna, do all I this point, user land. Yeah, I want to point out that, that uh, a virtue of this that's not necessarily obvious uh, is that uh, you can only dereference if you have the thing to use to look it up. So from a capability yes. perspective, the structure itself doesn't carry the mutability. Right. You have to already have shared access to the mutability in order to do the lookup. And among two things that don't have shared access to common mutability, uh, they still don't have a communications channel. You can share these things between entities that should not be able to communicate and by itself, it does not enable them to communicate. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. So um, these, the, so we, we I, the, all of these user land solutions we think are really valuable and cover 90% of the use case, especially there have been a lot of people that have talked about templating um, these records and tuples via this like bookkeeping strategy. And we think this is this user land solution is more than sufficient for most of those use cases. Um, but there are some, uh, I will say it again, sharp edges with um, this around memory management. Uh, because if you have a nested record or tuple that has some like array indices and some, you know, s external reference bookkeeping system, um, then the lifetime of those referenced objects is dependent presumably on the bookkeeper itself. So if you have to manually keep track of all that, it becomes tedious. You have to, you have to manually create these um, references using this external object. And it gets, you know, there's a lot of boilerplate involved in making this all work. Um, in, in particular, uh, the, the ref bookkeeper or the template thing only makes sense if you pass that bookkeeper around with the record or tuple. Right. You might you might want to use it in kind of a global way where you have just one bookkeeper, uh, but then things will just be held alive forever, uh, because every primitive there there's no primitive that has identity that you could put in a weak map or that has like unforgeability as this core property. Right. Exactly. Could, if if you're if you're using this in like a uh, a templating scenario where you control both sides of the 
uh, execution, then you don't need the unforgeability. So you can just use array indices or something. But if you want that extra guarantee and want to not have to deal with manual memory management, then you need something more. And our proposed solution to this is um, uh, a new primitive type called box that, um, uh, and the additional object or uh, primitive wrapper capital B box that wraps an object into what is effectively a reified func object pointer um, that then has a uh, prototype method in it called DREF that gives you back the original object referenced. No, this, this exactly violates the principle. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, it doesn't. And uh, I can jump to the explanation of that or we could like hear the API surface and then I can explain why it doesn't uh, violate. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, no, interject. So, That's, uh, I mean, so when you, so you, you have this box constructor that takes an object and returns a primitive, uh, then box prototype has a DREF method. So uh, you can scroll down a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, if you call DREF from, so what, when, you, when you call the DREF method, obviously that's calling it based on the, the box wrapper is constructed in the current realm. And so the realm points to D DREF is the only thing that can dereference those boxes. I'm, I'm not so talking about isolating realms. I'm talking about isolating subgraphs within a realm. It will, but this is a deniable API that you can. Uh, it's you can, it, you're making it part of the language. A principle that we have kept to is that the primordials have no hidden state. So. Uh, so, so libraries that follow best practices and don't mutate primordials uh, work in a context where those primordials are frozen. Uh, we are not going to be introducing stateful, uh, you know, st hidden state into the standard primordial heap. Um, uh, okay. well, this is exactly why I came up with the earlier ref collection. Yeah which doesn't have this, but then it became, everybody said it was too unergonomic. So maybe this is kind of a non-starter because of that. So, but, the, you know, so, I think so let, me, let, me, let me cut to the chase on something. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things I was expecting uh, to say when you got there, but now I need to say it early, uh, is um, I previously had objected to unregistered symbols being accepted as weak map keys. And I, and I objected to it for good reasons, uh, but uh, what, but it was, you know, altogether a, um, a not a fatal objection. It was an objection with a certain strength. Uh, and at the time, there was no compelling use case for unregistered symbols as weak map keys. I think uh, you're about to get to what I consider to be a compelling use case. Uh, and given that compelling use case, uh, that for me overcomes my reasons to object from for to unregistered symbols as weak map keys. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so that's... basically, I see these. Uh, there are three alternatives: basically, ref collection, symbol as weak map keys, and box. The diff the main difference is exactly the thing that Mark raised: that box has this one built-in ref collection that's realm wide. It's deniable, but it's already instantiated for you. So. If it's unacceptable, and I was I was wondering how unacceptable that would be. I was trying to convince myself, oh, if it's deniable, then maybe it's okay, but I guess not. No. So the thing about ref collection, basically, imagine box, but instead uh, there's a factory. So if you can you scroll back up to the box API? The thing is that yeah. the ref collection name was totally unintuitive for JavaScript programmers. JavaScript programmers that we talked to about this uh, so far, uh, like to think about boxing objects, but what you actually want is a box factory. So you don't want there to be a single box per a box factory factory because <laughs> this box constructor is a box factory. A, a, box, uh, a box factory solves the problem completely. Yeah, and that's what ref collection is because ref okay. collection you have to instantiate it. Then you call ref collect. Then you call the ref collection ref method to get a symbol, and then you call the ref collection deref method on that same box factory ref collection to get what it points to. So my thought was, I mean, so obviously if you, if you call deref on something that's not in that ref collection, it's going to return undefined or throw an exception or something. So I thought we might implicitly have one of those per realm and that maybe this would be okay because the realm API is coming. 
right? No, it's the, the, the um, uh, when you have multiple compartments within a, within a realm with frozen primordials, uh, you, you want them to be able to use uh, the full normal language, which therefore includes anything that, that you know, uh, is, is proposed to become part of the normal uh, language, um, uh, and still not have a communications channel that is not explicitly granted. Yeah. Uh, the thing about your box factory that's perfect is that you would have to share the box thing that the box factory I'm sorry, when you say box factory, I want to make sure that we have the right level of indirection. The box, the uh, fa it's really a factory, a box factory, factory factory. Okay, <laughs> something, right. something that, right, a box factory factory, something that makes the box table, right. the hidden table. Exactly, exactly. So right. what my misunderstanding was, I thought with the Realm API, we might be moving, and with the Realm shim and everything going in that direction, we might have been moving towards a world where every time you have a membrane, you also have a separate realm. And in yeah. that case, I thought it might be okay to have box be there because it is nicer to just call DREF on it directly. But if that's not the direction, then good to know. Yeah, uh, uh, TC53 uh, and uh, XS um, uh, are only planning a single realm world. Uh, and uh, a single realm world um, where uh, the SES use, uh, which is the one that TC53 is adopting as the base standard, uh, is one in which the primordials are frozen. And that's the means of isolating subgraphs, uh, is they all share one realm. It's just that what you implicitly share by virtue of being in the realm uh, is all of JavaScript, but no communications channel. Uh, so that's good context. So I'm wondering, what would you prefer to be the primitive that we add to the language? Would it be symbols as weak map keys, allowing you to build your own ref collection? Or would it be a ready-made ref collection? Or we could have something that's like ref collection, which is the box factory, but with a new primitive type that's not symbol, so that we don't get mixed up with registered symbols being this weird exception. Okay, so uh, that, so it's interesting to, because you're basically your box factory factory, whatever we call it, uh, is essentially your ref collection, as you said, except that it's introducing a new type. Um, yeah, but the new type is a very superficial thing. I mean, the only difference between box and symbol is that, uh, you know, besides working in the DREF method is that you can't use it as a property key. But yeah. otherwise, it's, it's totally, you know, the the core the core thing that I see about both box and symbol is that they're unforgeable, except for a few that you construct through certain well, ways. And well, so let's be very specific. We're talking about unregistered symbols. Yeah. Um, so I th so I still think I favor the box thing is tempting, but it's it's fairly you know it's still fairly heavy to introduce a new primitive type into the language. Yes. Uh, uh, I think the solution that I favor uh, remains that we allow unregistered symbols, specifically unregistered symbols, uh, to, be, to also be weak map keys. OK. When you say unregistered, do you mean all symbols that don't come from symbol.4, or do you also mean the primordial symbols, like symbol.iterator? I mean that. Uh, yes. What? Uh, symbol.iterator. Um, uh, is not unregistered, or rather is not in the category that I have in mind. That, that makes sense. It's different from, you know, one way that we could query whether something is registered is symbol.key4, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a broader set. But yeah. that makes perfect sense to me. Okay. I'm, I'm still confused about the, the box, the reference. Um, in the context of multiple realms and such. So if, if you get it. Well, you know, we, we presented a solution. The solution doesn't correspond to the invariance that this group is working towards. And uh, so I don't know if it, I don't know if it makes sense to spend a lot. I mean, I can clarify, but it just doesn't meet the requirements here. Um, I know we're starting to run short of time here. Um, 
I'm wondering if I can take a step backwards from from the dot from the details here. Um, I've been re I've been thinking about this boxing objects spec and comparing it to another one I've been following for a little bit, uh, Bradley's composite uh, Richard Keys spec. It seems like they're covering very similar use cases. Um, here's what I'm getting at. You've got a uh, you you're trying to create a <laughs> what effectively is a is a uh, <sighs> You've got a uh, record, which can be used as a as a key, which is a composite of several other pieces. Um, in the record and tuple case, those are based off of primitives, which is fine. But you but you, now you're trying to introduce objects into that model, non-primitives, which are not which are harder to deal with. And what I'm getting at is, when I look at the composite key proposal that as part of the richer keys proposal. Um, it seems that it does almost exactly the same thing that you're trying to do here. So there's a big difference. Um, they're, they are certainly relatable, but they're somewhat inverted. Um, so the purpose of this box and what's being talked about is to essentially relate um, those referential types versus to these records and tuples, uh, whereas kind of a composite key was taking the inverse approach where you have the reference type and you're trying to convert it into some sort of opaque value type. Um, what I do not see how we could use the same mechanism as composite key, which is using weak maps under the hood um, to get the behavior of the boxing here. Um, the box is going to produce some value, or if we use symbols, it'll be a symbol. Um, and then you need to go from two things. You need to go from a record or these value types and the symbol together to form kind of a position. And then from there is where you get the value back out. Um, it seems to me at least to be inverted, but maybe you could use it for the purpose here. Well, I was really looking at the, um, at what <sighs> Bach, the box of an object would be a component in the overall key, as I understand, which here is a record. It, I, I find this, this relation very confusing. I'm, I think it doesn't sound like we're going to go forward with this box proposal as stated here. So I'm not sure it's, because box is, box is a key in, a, in an abstract sense, is a key in this, this DREF mapping. And composite keys, you know, the, the reason that the mapping exists is because it has to be weak. Composite keys doesn't have to do with that kind of weak mapping. I think they're just unrelated, except in maybe some high level sense. Um, another way we could try to frame that is composite keys associate data with a group of objects. And what Box is doing is instead uh, having data that is, is in the opposite direction. I would say it the exact same way in English. That's, that's actually quite terrifying. Um, <laughs> you would... <laughs> Composite key takes reference, referential data and tries to bind its a group of referential data. It's trying to group referential data. There we go. That's a good way of putting it. And this is instead trying to take a value and then allow a, it, a value, not, not reference, uh, to associate with a group of references. Uh, this is hard to explain. I'm, I'm very sorry. I think, 
because, because, because we're running out of time, I want to, um, uh, and, I th I th and I think we are where we are on the relationship between those two proposals. Um, uh, I, will, I just want to ask if you have thoughts on relationship with yet another proposal that you that I apologize you've tried to get my attention on, and I haven't uh, been giving it attention, uh, which is the read-only collections proposal, which is also uh, something that's um, you know that this this group has been um, uh, you know helping along. Um, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about the read-only collections proposal. So. I spent a, a while thinking about this. Actually, Yehuda Katz pressed me on this, saying like, should we really, like, what does this mean conceptually? Should we really have these two separate things? And I was thinking about, is there some way that we could have, you know, if these collections are primitive, then they can only point to primitives, but then it could also be constructed as an object. I, I came to the mental conclusion that we really do want two separate constructors. Yeah. Uh, but that they should be analogous. Right. Uh, Good. The project to make them analogous is kind of uh, slow to get started because right now we have the disjoint sets of types where you have maps and, and typed arrays, presumably, and uh, we only have arrays and objects, or I mean, the, the primitive equivalent. I think eventually it would make sense to have um, primitive maps and things like that. Mm. Uh, like record maps. I don't know what you'd call them, map records. Uh, and the idea at that point would be to make sure that the interfaces are analogous. So with tuple and record having interfaces that are analogous to object and array, the challenge would be for, you know, record map to have a an interface that's totally analogous to immutable map. So they can and also map for that matter. Yeah. I have a name for you. Well, uh, mostly, but then there are some places where it'll differ. Like we use pushed instead of push. And so those are areas where we'll differ from the normal one, but we'll be in common with among among each other. Right. I'm sorry, what, what was that last point? I didn't understand it. Uh, there, there will be some methods that are a little bit different, like records. Uh, sorry, like tuples have a push method instead of instead of push because it has a different name because it has a different signature and meaning and everything. I'm sorry, spell the name? Uh, push ed at the end. Sorry, say again? Push ed. Oh, oh, okay, great, great. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. And opt and all that. Right, uh, like the past tense versions of them. Yes, I love it. And so if we ever had an immutable array, which I understand is sort of under debate or less likely, uh, then well, the idea would be that we would use the same APIs for that. So I would really want to coordinate with this group to make sure that we, that we have APIs that are sort of cross borrowable when we get to that later point where we want to introduce those okay. analogous things. Yeah, and I would certainly consider it uh, in bounds and in fact attractive to expand the read-only collections proposal uh, to include something array-like um, uh, and, uh, and array-like enough that having it be, um, uh, uh, actually, you know, having it be tuple-like, um, but, but within the, um, the overall uh, system of the read-only collections, where you've got the mutable one and the, and the immutable one and the read-only view, um, and you've got the um, the methods for making one from the other. So I I, I think I see these things as um, uh, exactly as as I think you stated, which is they can grow to be analogous. So the cognitive burden uh, is minimized of learning both, uh, but they're still disjoint mechanisms. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, on a naming idea, um, in the way that a tuple is effectively uh, a concise way to say immutable array and the way um, record is a concise way of saying immutable object, uh, if you find yourself needing a name for an immutable map, uh, uh, an idea struck me to call it a relation. There is a mathematical problem there, which is a map 
Yeah. A relation is a function with it accepts a number, or accepts a value and returns a value in math anyway. But well, a relation is many is is many many, and these are like functions uh, many one. I see. Okay. Well, yeah, I think well. uh, I kind of want to reduce the number of new words we introduce. Uh, record and tuple is already two words. I would hope that if we make um, and I like how the immutable collections proposal just introduces and the immutable words yeah, are, which is perfectly fine orthogonal um, I feel a little bit bad like we had earlier drafts that were like const array and const object but then that was also like eh, this is misleading because they're not arrays and they're not objects and uh, one one thing is there would be no sense in having an immutable record an immutable object because that's just object dot freeze I imagine right. you agree on that right um it's a uh, we're over time. Um, I'd like to uh, pause the recording.